networking here. Oh, there we go. No more networking here. Just about a year ago, I went out on the road, seeking for fame and fortune, looking for a pot of gold. Things got bad and things got worse. I guess you know the tune. Oh Lord, I'm stuck in a low die again. Rolling on a greyhound, I'll be walking out if I go. I was just passing through. Must be seven months or more. I ran out of time and money. Looks like my plans fell through. Oh Lord, I'm stuck in a low die again. I should probably do this button. Don't want to be too erotic out here. So today, we'll be talking about the first three chapters of Black Jackman's, which is a terribly enjoyable book and very well read. Uh, James is a great pro stylist, which is pretty rare among historians, and you got to give it up when you find it. Uh, it seems like there are a lot of, the sweet spot really does seem like the 30s for a lot of that, like really... Uh, uh, prose, uh, poem, prose poetic history, where it's like, you know, you're getting, you're getting a synthesis. You're not getting, you know, an academic treatise, but you are getting also a work of literature. And I would put this among here. Uh, another book that I would recommend for anybody who wants to read something like that is C.V. Wedgwood's book on the 30 years war. Uh, just, to, just delightful, incredibly easy to read. And that's difficult with, uh, with, uh, which this, with this sort of history, like Reconstruction, for example. Reconstruction is a great book, but, you know, Fawner is, he is trying to build like this, this house of evidence, you know, and like stack up this narrative. It's more workmanlike, whereas this is more, uh, frankly, artistic, which is something that's gotten squeezed out of uh, history, honestly, as it's become more and more specialized and professionalized. You know, the creation of the academy as such, especially the neoliberal academy, the, the academy of, uh, you know, constant production in order to get uh, these few sinecures Sinecures, uh, sinecures. It, it's, it leads you to the point where you're just uh, you're just pointing at things, or you're just throwing out words that you know people want to hear. All right, so we'll probably do we'll do the next three for next week, same time. Wednesday. No, no, we won't be doing it Wednesday. Next Tuesday, probably. Uh, that'll be the, the next three chapters. So. The first chapter of uh, James's book, which was written in 1938, as I said, and uh, another thing that distinguishes it as a product of that time, in addition to its prose style, is the fact that uh, James is clearly uh, operating in, in a polemic mode. He's trying to use, explicitly, use the story of the uh, Haitian Revolution creating a historic narrative, you know, conjuring a, a vision of this thing that did happen uh, in the moment of uh, 
colonial, the first inklings of colonial upheaval uh, in the periphery. Because uh, World War I, like, fatally wounded the empires of Europe, but it took World War II to, to doom them finally. Uh, and in that interwar period is when you saw the first real explosion of coordinated anti-imperial activism in the in the empire. And C.L.R. James is from Trinidad, which is part of the British Empire. And he wrote this book as uh, an explicit parallel for the times. And he is he is at several points in the book analogizes the slaves of Saint Domingue to the uh, restive African and Asian and uh, Latin American uh, subjects of the European imperial system. And that their task was the same that the Haitian slaves was, that they were to complete the historical uh, mission begun by the ha Haitian slaves. Uh, and that the context of the incipient war in Europe that was uh, that was on the horizon for everyone to see uh, would be the cause of that, or, or would be the opportunity, like the world, the, the the crisis in the in the in the in the capitals of Europe that was occurring as Hitler was continuing his brinksmanship towards the Poland invasion. Uh, that is analogous to the conflict among the, the whites of San Domingo. And what ended up happening is, is along those lines in that it was the war that led to the creation of the first really organized, effective uh, military uh, insurgencies against empire. And you saw uh, uh, Algeria, uh, Vietnam, of course, uh, India, obviously, uh, Kenya, Cuba, of course, and that uh, process did lead to a, a, a sort of liberation, you know, but it was uh, the same stunted liberation that the uh, Haitians got which is they were able to secure their independence as a nation among nations, but cut off from capital and doomed to be a, a, a client state of more powerful capitalist governments in the things that, in the, in the, uh, the, the trade system that took over for colonialism and perpetuated the colonial relationship. That's what the Cold War is. It is, the, it is Western capitalism imposing itself as the post-colonial uh, imperial authority that maintains the maintaining the relationship, the economic relationship between uh, the periphery and the metropoles of the uh, old empires that are no longer uh, affordable, that had to be uh, gotten rid of. And Haiti got that. Haiti got independence, but it was cut off from all trade to the United States, which refused to recognize it until the Civil War, uh, forced to pay billions of dollars, billions with a B, in uh, reparations to France for the for committing the crime of self-liberation. Because they could, because France could do that. And the post-colonial third world became a place where every country was a Haiti, in that they had independence formally within this nation state formation, but then they were still stuck in the capitalist structure and forced to, uh, to trade on the capitalism's demands, which means cheap uh, goods to the center. Labor, uh, difficult, painful labor, extractive labor at, uh, to, the ex to the periphery, uh, 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 relatively milder labor, uh, and surplus from the periphery to the center. That relationship was perpetuated by the global Bretton Woods system that was imposed after the war because the West could do it, because the Russians stopped fighting and allowed them to uh, dictate terms and doomed the Soviet project in the long run, unless they were willing to actually fight for it, which they weren't. Um, 
And so as in Haiti, you saw the development of, instead of a liberated population, a, uh, a system where a few wealthy families in Haiti were able to uh, secure positions uh, as colonial uh, apparatchiks of Western capitalism and then operate the uh, extractive economy of Haiti uh, with the same coercive mechanisms uh, that were in operation with the colonial authorities. Not with the name of slavery anymore, uh, but with uh, a similar relationship between the government uh, and its ruling class that backs it and the actual mass of people of Haiti. And then Haitian uh, political history is, 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 is a story of fights within these concentrations of power, broken up occasionally by U.S. military intervention. Uh, the United States occupied Haiti for, I believe it was from the Wilson administration until Hoover? I think like 19, uh, I think 1914 uh, or something until 1931. Uh, Someone can correct me on that. Uh, and that's completely forgotten. No one, literally nobody knows that. Uh, and uh, in the United States, like a fraction of a percentage of Americans know that, uh, or honestly would care if they did, you know, that's the thing about all this history stuff. Uh, it isn't really true that if only people knew, it's like they would just process it through their preconceived ideas and what they think they want. And then they would get the same answer. It's not the fact that, uh, does something. It's the fact in context. It's the narrative built, which is what J James is trying to do. Build a narrative that could be persuasive, that can carry you through battle. But that occupation, as you can imagine, was incredibly brutal. Like, this is America at the absolute height of its race hatred. America's American racism, in terms of, like, as a social uh, value, reached its uh, uh, absolute apogee in America uh, in the uh, early 20th century because of the stresses of the Great Migration, because race, race hatred was concentrated in the South because that is where blacks were concentrated. And it was the breaking of those geographic bonds and mass entrance of, of blacks into urban areas that triggers this, this massive explosion of race violence. You had 1919, the Red Summer, which is a series of incredibly bloody race riots that occur all throughout uh, American cities. Uh, and that is, that is the latent racism uh, of uh, a society at that point uh, being put under strain, put under pressure, and you see this explosion. And so you see racism become, for the first time, this nationwide self-conscious uh, pursuit, which is why you see the second clan at this point. And this is why you have, uh, you have the clan running the state government of Indiana through the Republican Party. That is how detached from... The, the traditional regional uh, racial obsession that uh, characterized white society there uh, had bled out into the whole country. Um, and it was a crisis that was fundamentally uh, solved first by, as always, uh, repressing uh, and policing uh, black people and, and, and enforcing segregation in the land and in the cities too uh, in order to, uh, you know, relieve white anxiety uh, because, you know, they, are, they do not have representation in the system. And so they can be used that way without it uh, affecting the decision-making of actual governors because it doesn't matter to them. They're not at, they're not at, at uh, hold, beholden to them at all. But then, what led to this, what allowed the civil rights movement to happen, and for that racism to kind of push away enough to allow for something like the civil rights movement, and then the civil rights acts, and and formal segregation being uh, abolished everywhere, were was the surpluses of the post-war era. It was the good times provided for by the establishment of this uh, global post-colonial structure of oppression. This is all a tangent to say that 
America's ra most racist army occupying for over a decade uh, the first and only black uh, republic in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, my God, it was brutal. It was monstrous. It was it was a it was a government organized lynch mob running a country. And then we leave and leave uh, propped up those people who were more committed to the project of being rich than to any national, uh, any kind of solidarity beyond their own disgusting inbred families, which is how you see reproduced in the, in the, the free slave republic the same social dynamics that existed in the, the, uh, the, Repu the uh, colony. I mean, do you think that the, the ruling families of Haiti have uh, any warmer feelings for the masses of Port-au-Prince than, uh, than the fucking old planters did for the slaves in the field? And then we propped up the Duvalier family as a literal client uh, gang to run the country on our behalf. And then when they first, and then when, uh, and then when uh, Aristide gets in there and starts destabilizing the, the power structure and introducing, you know, regular uh, Haitians into politics and changing the equation, uh, he had to go. It's amazing. We we they they uh, Jean Paul Aristide was uh, overthrown by American trained uh, military guys on behalf of the ruling families of Haiti. Then we put him back in power. I think this is because uh, more than anything, it triggered a big uh, refugee crisis in Florida that was not something that Bill Clinton wanted to see. And so they figured we put Aristide back in, but because we did it, he owes us. But then he got too big for his britches again, and we fucking kidnapped him. We kidnapped him and dropped him in the Central African Republic. We claimed that uh, he asked us to do that for him, but he says that didn't happen. And it's, who are you going to believe, I guess? You know, maybe he's just trying to save face, but even if he didn't, it's another case where we just uh, went in there to unilaterally decide who's in charge. And now the uh, U.S.-backed president who has been triggering massive street demonstrations for refusing to leave office and is worrying a lot of uh, powerful people in Haiti that he might trigger a revolution gets murked by mercs, maybe, from Miami, including FBI informants? Or are they patsies? Either way, it seems like, and now we have uh, Haitians... Uh, in government asking for America military intervention and the U.S. saying that they're weighing it. The development plan that the U.S. has made for Haiti in the last 20 or so years, since they, uh, since they, since the Duvaliers fell, really, uh, was to intervene enough in Haiti to establish the, the, uh, governmental legitimacy and uh, infrastructure uh, to carry out a process of uh, restructuring around uh, um, factory labor. Essentially, turn Haiti into uh, one of those uh, sweatshop countries in Asia, uh, which had been prevented by that point because Haiti didn't have strong enough, really, institutions to pull people off the land. I mean, they had uh, done a good job uh, of destroying the agricultural sector through uh, the dumping of American uh, uh, subsidized agriculture into the thing, same thing they did in Mexico and elsewhere, uh, to destroy their domestic uh, uh, agricultural sector. Uh, but it was hard to get uh, private investment to in, into the kind of capital-intensive uh, uh uh, capital intensive operations that you would need to um, 
that you would need to actually get a lot of labor out of that Haiti's uh, urban slum population. Uh, it was there wasn't enough infrastructure around it to make that uh, a, a, a decent investment, and so the UN and the fucking Clinton Foundation has spent the last few decades trying to uh, uh, proletarianize the uh, the lumpen population of Port-au-Prince. But you got to figure, even if the U.S. doesn't invade Haiti, this moment allows for some sort of transition of power that everyone can cross their fingers and hope will tamper down the the uh, anger in the streets. Uh, and maybe it will. I mean, change, that's what that's why we have elections is to get people riled up and then have their uh, their uh, pent up anger released through the uh, emotional spectacle of a changing of power. Like, you have to do it. If you don't do it, eventually they throw, overthrow you. You lose the mandate of heaven. Unless you have a little fake change every four or eight years. Or after somebody gets shot in their fucking bed. <laughs> okay. So, this is all back... All bring us back to the first chapter of the Black Jacobins, which is about the uh, experience of being a slave in French Saint Domingue, and his main uh, James' main goal here is to give you a true sense of the horror of it, of the genuine, of the misery that inflicted on humans and and that and the misery that that uh that then shaped the culture around that uh um and part of the thing that makes it so brutal is how james repeatedly uh highlights the fact that uh shorn of the mystifications that you'd have in a in a bourgeoisified like uh, developed country like England or, or even France at that point, uh, where, of course, you have brutality, you have brutal uh, class segregation, and you have oppression and filth and misery, but there is also a, there is a, a ritual around it. You know, there are rituals of, of obligation around it that cloud everything and that make it feel more, uh, more consensual, because it is, because people have, like, a shared experience that makes them invest in the world around them, even the parts that are serving their uh, oppression, because they don't, they can't recognize the difference. That is how we build our consciousness. It's not that, that the reason false consciousness is an, an incorrect uh, term is that it implies there is such thing as a true consciousness. There's not. False consciousness is just a shortcoming from when that consciousness, which is always false, is false in a way that hinders class consciousness because class consciousness is also false in that you're picking a group of people to, to identify with psychically that is fundamentally arbitrary but it's arbitrary in a way that moves the fucking wheel of history because we're all just guessing and being pushed towards outcomes uh by the grinding of the gears of history that's it so for James, because uh, colonial uh, plantation agriculture is capitalism shorn of all of its uh, attendant mysteries, you get the purest expression of material interests, of people operating from a belief only in their own most selfish, indulgent conception of pleasure. Because the thing about... Uh, the thing that distinguishes plantation slavery most of all uh, from uh, capitalism in, as it was per, uh, being carried out in like the burgeoning uh, uh, merchant capitals of Europe and North America uh, oh, fuck I completely forgot
People are really talking about whether or not Haiti should become a state. Oh, brother. They would never do that because they're trying to do it at the minimum of cost. They're trying to, and, and standing the place up as a sweatshop is the lowest uh, capital input. Be, it would cost way too much to make a state. Fuck. I was saying something about what the uh, fundamental difference between those two forms of capitalism were. But then I just lost it. Oh, this is it. Is that capital is not reinvested. When the merchants of the cities of, of Boston and London, when they not profit on a venture, they maybe had a, a nice duck that they put some uh, towards the building of a new part of their house, but the majority of it, they reinvested. And that is what builds capital intensity in the cities, and that's what builds uh, the infrastructure of capitalism, like factories and 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 uh, and. and you know, uh, gives the people who come from the countryside to the city a put a place to go and a way to be uh, productive is rap capital reinvestment. In slave in plantation agriculture, that capital is spent. They just fucking spend it because there is no need to invest at a certain level. You got the land. You got the slaves. If you have sugar, you have the sugar processing facilities, which are relatively high investment. Uh, but for like indigo or a cotton plantation or, or uh, rice, you've got a couple of buildings, basically. And you are not, uh, you're not a corporation. You're just a guy. You're just a guy. And you probably, honestly, uh, are in a lot of debt. So all your money goes to repaying your debt and then spending it uh, on fancy, fancy gloves and, and uh, wines, a way to create the illusion of civilization in a place where you're just sitting in a fucking dark field forcing someone to work for you. And that consumption. Rice is more complicated because it is more uh, labor intensive. But remember, if you have slave labor, uh, the, that's a different uh, uh, cost dynamic. It's not as capital intensive is what I meant. And so that is why you have the colonial, uh, 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 that's why colonial and uh, then slave places are more backwards, less developed, more just savage, uh, and the culture that they produce is more savage. And uh, that is because everybody here is just living by their material in the narrowest sense uh, uh, interests. And, of course, that's why they were destroyed. That's why the slaves were able to defeat them, because they were everyone was operating out of this base material uh, interest. And at the end of the day, there were too many slaves whose base material interest was freedom uh, and those motherfuckers, at a certain point, they couldn't even agree what they wanted. And so they were doomed. And you see again and again the, 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 uh, the planter class dooming themselves uh, in the long term for short-term advantage. So the first chapter is, is mostly about the misery of the slave uh, and how it made San Domingo a miserable place. Uh, but then a second chapter, Owners, which is about the whites of uh, San Domain, uh, really goes very far, uh, the great pains to show uh, that the misery uh, of the colony was felt in both halves because, well, of course, the, the, the whites were all uh, living lives of relative pleasure and leisure. They were also uh, creating a culture of absolute miserable uh, nasty brutishness. They, they were living as pigs. They were living as pigs in cravats. And so this math, this this uh, rather than like the the dream of the like the the southern aristocracy was always that uh, being a slave owner in America allowed you to be like an ancient Athenian. You could spend all day doing philosophy and reasoning, 
uh, and, and figuring out ideal forms of government and, and contributing to the general good because somebody else is doing all the shit work. And, and you were, you, your mind was better spent there because you were more advanced. You were uh, uh, smarter and therefore more valuable. Your time is more valuable. But the colonists of Saint-Domingue showed that that is absolutely not what happens. Uh, in, 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 amongst the absolute brutality of, uh, of American and Caribbean slavery, unlike anything that happened and existed in ancient, uh, e ancient Greece, there is no culture. There is no culture. There is just this savage grotesquerie. Uh, the whites of Haiti really do remind you of like the more carnivalesque grotesques of our of our ruling class. But because it's uh, it is dissension within the white ranks that helps lead to the revolution, James uh, takes pains to point out that there are different groups of white people uh, in San uh, Domingue, different classes. You had the planters who actually owned the plantations, uh, many of them uh, uh, down, uh, downwardly mobile uh, aristocrats, basically. Uh, people who were uh, maybe the disinherited second son of a family uh, from a, a rural uh, maison, or whatever the fuck, uh, who could uh, get the family name back, some, some stature by uh, making money in the in the, uh, the third world. The big whites, they were called. And there was very few of them, uh, but they had the vast majority of the wealth of the, of the, of the plantation, of the, uh, of the colony. Then you had, uh, the small whites, the administrators, the overseers, the lawyers, the shopkeepers, the people do, who are doing jobs that could not be, uh, given to slaves because the education necessary to have them do those jobs would make them too dangerous to let them do those jobs. So those jobs had to be done by white people. And that is where you get the real uh, uh, dregs of French society, the white dregs uh, who aren't trying to rebuild a family name with money they have or money that they could borrow, but are just trying to find any kind of uh, employment. And of course, to say dregs is not to say like, the fact that they uh, were poor made them bad. It, it just meant that they could not continue to expect to live in France and not have life just get worse and worse over time. So Haiti was their chance to do that. And uh, there they were, of course, the, the people who were most devoted to um, the color line because as James points out, racial segregation, or, or racial segregation of like uh, of, of spaces and uh, and of uh, prescribed rights based on uh, race, was not uh, did not emerge instantly. Uh, uh, there were no early regulations or statutes about race in, in uh, Haiti. Uh, it was over time, over the course of the 1700s. Uh, that that comes into play as the the small whites uh, insist that if they're going to be in Haiti here, taking this shit in this place where they're risking yellow fever all the time and going to be at the beck and call of these these fancy people, then they have to be assured that they're never going to have to do any of the real work. That that is a pres that there is a prescribed group who who uh, will take that labor. And that makes them feel less precarious because precarity is the driver of all middle class political activities, not solidarity, precarity, because they cannot, they're not, a, they're not class conscious. They are self-conscious because they are the product of liberalism. They are the, the purest product of liberalism is the middle class. And their precarity in this point drove them to assert a color line that led to the creation of an incredibly intricate 
array of legal rights that are distinguished based on percentage and fraction of uh, of black blood, stuff that is absolutely absurd. And and and, and to think that people sat there and wrote this stuff down and took it seriously is, it is it's it's grimly kind of funny because of how ab ridiculous in the, in the bosom of the Enlightenment these people doing this thing. Uh, but it was necessary. Uh, it was required to maintain the social strata because you needed those whites there, and that meant you needed that line there. But that con that relationship is complicated by the fact that you have this other group, uh, what James calls uh, the mulattoes, uh, the colored population, uh, the 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 products of. Uh, uh, European and, and African reproduction. And because of the very, very small number of whites in the colony uh, and the need for uh, people in an intermediate uh, position that is not slave but is not really master either because there's some jobs a master can't do, but you can't have a slave do. And so you need whites for some of them, but for others you need uh, someone who is outside of uh, you know full citizenship but enjoys a privileged position relative to slaves but then uh, therefore will feel their precarity and so you get the uh, the colored population people who uh, are the product of relationships consensual or non-consensual between uh, slaves and uh, whites who are not uh, who are free upon birth and are able to uh, uh, buy property, and that puts them in a position where, even though they get, they don't have le equal uh, legal standing to whites, they are, uh, and they have to. They're uh, forced to perform uh, compulsory military uh, service in slave patrols that white people don't have to, didn't have to do, uh, but they're not slaves. And they're more aware of the danger of becoming a slave than they are inspired by the thought of being uh, equal. And so, but, in the, this is why these systems are so ingenious and the way they emerge is so organic. Uh, the colored population is, adheres to the uh, white population uh, and not the, not the black slave because... They can own property because they can, they are uh, connected materially to the interests of the slave economy. They can own slaves. They can work in, in, in the colonial economy that depends on slavery. They can make money there. They can lend money there. And so they have a material interest that is with slavery, even though slavery treats them as second class just like the small whites have a, a material interest in a color line that stands in for their uh, th uh, their uh, social guarantee of not doing slave work. And that is and that's that is what keeps these systems going from from the middle area, from the from the fat of it, from the people who at any point could hypothetically stop everything from working, because they have the most crucial choke points. What's keeping them all in this system is that they feel more than anything a precarity and a fear of falling, uh, and that's because they don't feel solidarity. And the theory of the theory of fucking Marxism is that the creation of uh, of of a a class based experience of exploitation creates a different uh, sense of uh, a different sense of best interest, a different sense of material interest. That means that instead of going towards despair and uh, rage, which is what happens when the middle class sees that it can, things can't get better within the current system, solidarity allows you to think that, no, well, we can overcome this system and replace it with something whereby we don't have to fear falling anymore. And that that feeling is uh, a more 
is a superior um, social mechanism for uh, seizing political power than just middle class precarity by itself. Because what fascism is, and I think we, we are in a post-fascism where we're inside a cone of misery and despair, and that means everybody within that framework of American liberalism, which includes the entirety of the Republican and Democratic Party, as in people who adhere to a liberal world where they believe that capitalism is eternal. That is, the, that is who we're talking about. And if you're Republican or Democrat, not talking about how you feel about anything. I'm talking about what's you know, the systems that you're part of and the systems that you ritually engage with and psychologically engage with, what they represent. Those parties represent holes within one reality where capitalism is immutable and everything is going to get worse forever. That is the world that everybody within the bubble of American politics lives now. And our politics is an expression of that. And if you really believe that, then politics can only serve as a vessel for revenge against somebody whose fault it is. Because the fault cannot be, the fault has to be assigned. And then if you can act, you can only act by destroying. And the difference is how much have you displaced your own sense of guilt and responsibility within this system. And so the Democrats are those people led at the top by those people who are, I wouldn't, no, I would not say led at the top. I would say the, the majority of their supporters who vote and participate as Democrats. Uh, at the top, it's, it's just Moloch. But, uh, because they are, they're, they're shielded from everything. Everything's going to be fine for them. They have underwater bunkers. They're going to be fine. They're serving Moloch. Everybody elected by both parties is serving Moloch. Everybody at the top levels of the media is serving Moloch. But there are still people staffing these parties at the, at the staff level, at the level of like workers within the political infrastructure. And then, of course, those people who vote for them most assiduously and who organize for them most. Uh, those people, middle class, precarious, without the ability to think uh, in class terms and to hope for a, a challenge to the system that would make it better, would make life better, uh, have decided that it's their fault as highly educated white, as white people, basically, uh, that, that, that white society did this. Because what liberalism is, because it's urban liberalism is, is, is the middle class trying to convince themselves that it's right and just that they're sitting in a nice appointed room surrounded by misery. And that makes you start turning inward. And it turns, uh, it, 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 uh, and that means that you end up being overawed by your superego. You end up being, uh, you end up sublimating all of your libidinal energy into denial and punishment of the self. It's just Puritanism. Uh, and that is urban liber that is urban American liberalism, now suburban, whatever, the Democratic Party in general. And the way you do that as a liberal is by finding somebody else to blame who is like you but isn't you. Yes, white people, but uh, if I'm a white woman, white men. Uh, yes, white people, including white women, but uh, straight ones. Like some way that it isn't me. Or even if, yes, I am all those boxes, but I'm aware of it. And all of those things exude, exempt you from punishment, but that means somebody else has to pay. And so liberalism is now making some type of uh, understanding of Republicans, however you want to define that, pay. Be the first through the sh shoot. It's two, for, it's two guys falling into a fucking uh, uh, meat grinder and they're fighting to see who can push the other one in first so that they can watch them go through. And then, yes, they get destroyed too. But at that point, when you've given up hope 
for anything better. That's the only pleasure you can imagine. That's the only future that you can find solace in, is one where you're watching your enemy suffer. Now, the Republicans, they haven't sublimated shit. They're, they're out there loud and proud because they, their uh, political formations, their, uh, their traditions, their definitions of the terms we use to even think and reason our way through the world were forged in the more brutal chambers of slave of plantation economics. So they're not sublimated shit. The, 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 it's everybody else, it's somebody else's fault, not me. Not, not who I imagine myself or who I relate to. An other. It's the other. And I will destroy the other, and I will see the other destroyed before me. And so those are the two strains of a sadism at the heart of American politics. Uh, oh, also in this chapter, uh, J uh, James does a little uh, mind blowing for people who might have always uh, uh, nursed the idea. Hey, uh, you know, maybe if the British had not uh, had not been kicked out and we'd stayed a colonies, uh, they would have gotten rid of slavery earlier, and we wouldn't have had a civil war because. It's true that around the turn of the, the 19th century, uh, the British Empire uh, started agitating significantly uh, internally to abolish the slave trade, which it eventually did in the 1830s, uh, and then led and then began to patrol the Atlantic Ocean to suppress the slave trade uh, after being the biggest slave traders. And that's a story that is sometimes told in heroic ter terms, you know, uh, like the abolitionists of America. Uh, William Wilberforce and all that. Well, according to James, as soon as the uh, North American colonies were uh, lost, uh, it became in England's long-term uh, best economic interest uh, and geostrategic interest to end slavery uh, because they had enough uh, slaves. They could certainly ban the slave trade because they had enough uh, blacks in the colonies that they controlled already. Meanwhile, uh, Saint-Domingue, which was hugely profitable, the most profitable colony in the Americas, uh, but because it was so brutally exploitative and it required so much slave labor being imported because so many slaves died, it was really, it was, the, the, fact, the fact that it was the most uh, gruesomely, uh, physically degrading and dangerous slave colony is has a, an intimate relationship to why it was the most profitable. And so old wily uh, William Pitt over there in England figures out, hey, we could uh, burnish our credentials here uh, and also enforce a slave trade ban in the Atlantic that would allow us to cut off uh, uh, access to slaves to uh, the most profitable French colony and make it more vulnerable to us in our game with the frogs. So once again, James coming back to material interests uh, and and how how you can see through the bones of social nicety so much more clearly in a place like Haiti. And, in, and around uh, slavery specifically, where you see every consideration, social consideration, dissolve before the exig exigency of uh, maintaining slavery. So having set up the, the, the main uh, uh, social groupings within, uh, uh, within Haiti on the eve of the revolution, uh, James's third chapter is about how the colony responded to the French Revolution, which is what really tips everything in, out of balance. You'd had a miserable, grinding, relatively stable status quo in Haiti for hundreds of years at that point. Uh, the, 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 re, the reality of life as a, as a slave in Haiti was such that even though it was insanely, miserably, uh, uh, brutally uh, uh, miserable. I mean, one of the worst places to be a human. Uh, it was 
the the way of uh, the very nature of the uh, regime was such that uh, resistance to it was sort of tie, just drained of the population. Uh, people just literally didn't have the energy. They were kept uh, at a state of pretty much perpetual exhaustion to the point of death. Uh, and that allowed for this uh, thing to stay kind of stable. But then news comes from Paris. The king has called the general assembly, the state's general. What are we going to do? And uh, it leads to a big explosion of uh, political uh, ferment on the island. The big whites immediately uh, attempt to use the moment to secure independence for the colony. Because uh, like all uh, big for their britches colonists, they were sick of the merc mercantile system that forbid them from getting uh, materials from outside of France or selling outside of the French networks. Uh, and imagine that, well, with the king's authority now uh, compromised, fuck it. Uh, we will uh, we'll just be our own dudes. We'll, we'll rock. And then, but then the small whites... Uh, joined along uh, because the threat of the uh, National Assembly in Paris in this new revolutionary government to perhaps uh, mess with the racial arrangement. And one of the big things that destabilized uh, Haitian politics during this period was the, uh, uh, the loosening of uh, restrictions on blacks, the, the, the uh, or not blacks, I'm sorry, uh, coloreds, colored, uh, uh, as they were known, um, Haitians, uh, re um, increasing their access to civil rights and allowing uh, even uh, the handful of uh, coloreds who were uh, the product of two parents who were both free uh, at the time of birth uh, vote and the white and the small and white, uh, the small and big whites who in France are killing each other, or rather the the big the big whites are in the process of of being uh, of finally being you know held to account by uh, by the small whites of like the urban uh, uh, artisan classes the sans culotte. But they were on the same page in Haiti because uh, they were equally committed to the maintenance of the color line. Uh, meanwhile, the, uh, the the colored population uh, is trying to use the revolution to assert a universality of, of rights among property owners, and of course, not among any slave, which is what renders this whole pro uh, uh, this whole moment so kind of once again, grimly uh, absurd. There is a lot that's really brutally, grimly absurd about about the Haitian Revolution, uh, and it's because of uh, the absurdity of trying to run a civilized country uh, with pretensions to ideas of rights and obligations and, and laws uh, on top of just a giant machine of human misery. Right there, not uh, not somewhere else, not baffled through chambers of law and language and geography, right in your fucking face. When you have these people, uh, you know, uh, fighting for their civil rights, their, their universally recognized uh, human rights to be equal to the other slave owners. To be able to vote together with the other slave owners on what to do about the slaves. And all for a sweet, sweet, delicious treat that you put in your tea or coffee. Something that r rotted the teeth out of your gums uh, and kept you up late. And that's it. That's all it did. It wasn't necessary. 
It wasn't a, it wasn't a, 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 a needed element of the uh, European diet. So at the end of the third chapter, uh, an assembly has been called to replace an assembly that had broken up during this tumultuous battle uh, where all the while the uh, colonial authorities, who were the other group of white people I didn't mention earlier, the actual uh, military leaders and, and the, uh, the governor, the intendant and all that, uh, and, and the bureaucrats, uh, this thin sheen of, 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 uh, of legality on top of this whole process. Uh, they were unable to uh, control events. There weren't enough of them. Uh, there weren't enough troops there or, uh, or enough bureaucrats. And they were. there was an attempt by uh, the colonial authorities to uh, ally with the coloreds uh, to uh, check the uh, rebellious uh, coalition of the big and small whites. And it was in the... As this uh, battle was uh, heating up and as... Uh, the uh, colored population started making moves towards uh, insurrection. One had already happened uh, and been brutally repressed, the one by Auger. Uh, as this was happening, out of nowhere, some the people that these people had been talking in front of and mobilizing in front of uh, the whole time, and just were not even thinking about what they might be seeing, what they might be thinking, because of the screen of dehumanization that they had to put up, to keep themselves where they were. That very thing that allowed, that line that allowed them to gain all that power and to gain all that luxury and all those beautiful uh, homes and fine silks became the very thing that meant that it would be all go up in a fucking blaze of fire, in a fucking inferno as their uh, plantations were burned, as they were hacked to death with machetes. Because in the middle of all this strikes a strikes the the first mass uprising of the Haitian Revolution, and uh, fourth chapter will no doubt uh, uh, set the scene for that whole thing and step us through it. Uh, so yeah, three three next three chapters for uh, Tuesday Tuesday. But uh, I would say that 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 the sugar uh, industry is a good illustration of just how the colonial project provided the necessary uh, raw materials, uh, uh, trade establishment of trade networks, uh, and all most of and and importantly, um, uh, surplus uh, uh, production of, uh, lux of luxury foodstuffs helped capitalism in Europe s not collapse in on itself because capitalism is wildly destabilizing and it creates social, uh, it creates massive social dislocation as it occurs. It is, it, it is, it bores everything into oblivion and that means that it creates unstable political situations and it creates conflicts within societies and between societies, as the resources are ground into the maw, and as people are pulled away from their uh, their uh, established connections to the world around them and the people around them, and turned into individuals, and they resist. Everybody resists. The old ruling class resists because they weren't they didn't really sign up for this when they unleashed these forces. But and now they're going to try to fight, and then of course the peasants resist because they don't want to be made into whatever the hell this thing is has in mind for them, which they can't even imagine. And what gets them off of their fucking tractors and what gets them into the cities and what soothes the ball and soothes the anxious minds of the aristocrats and the landowners, sweet sugar. Sweet, delicious sugar. Gigaws. Gimcracks. Stuff that is all the product of a uh, trade 
of uh, raw resources processed by uh, slave labor on expropriated land. And honestly, I would say that that's the one thing that Marx under-emphasizes. Uh, and I think that under-emphasis under is the biggest explanation for why he uh, wasn't wrong, Marx wasn't wrong about anything, why he underestimated the timeline, the time scales that he was operating off of. And that was because not only did colonization jumpstart capitalism in Europe, it also provided a uh, like a stabilizing uh, fin as this thing was rocketing through European societies. And then the crucial moment came in the early 20th century when capitalism's headquarters moved from Europe to North America. And in that case, and once that happens, the inherent uh, instability in European capitalism can kind of blow itself up without destroying the whole system and then can be rebuilt. Creative destruction, baby, we love it, don't we? That's World War II, World War I and II. The Second Thirty Years' War, as I like to think of it as. Yes, the Cold War was World War III. That is correct. And we lost. I mean, we won. But we won then, but we are going to lose eventually. I might do a book on the Thirty Years' War after this, if I find a good one. I don't know, maybe Wedgwood again? There's this, like, thousand-page behemoth that I've always wanted to read and never got around to it, though. If anyone has another one, uh, let me know. Yeah, World War Four is not climate change annihilating us all. It's... Uh, Technology plus its human uh, technology plus its human traitor minions uh, destroying the rest of us. The climate change is just the context of them liquidating us uh, as needed. And when I say us, I mean all humans. I don't mean us as in Americans. Not right away. We will be the last to feel the blade. But what will make the blade send faster is how much we're going to be fixated on making sure that our enemies pay hit to take the blade first. That is what's going to, if anything does, crack it all up. Is is our politically invested po populace being so committed to uh, seeing somebody else suffer before them uh, that if things get destabled? The stabilized, uh, they're going to want, they're going to reach for the acts of destruction, not to, for solidarity. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're, they're going, we're, they're at war with us right now. And of course, for right now, we are also the ones they're on war on behalf of. Because right now they're fighting war on behalf of the American standard of living, basically. Because the American standard of living is what powers the world economy. It is the thing, it's the reason we have stuff. Is the American standard of living. 
and economic development is extending the American standard of living as far into the world as possible. Now, of course, that's impossible. You get to a point where you start having enough people living the American standard of living and the uh, fucking biome starts to collapse, which is what we're in. And so everybody who enjoys an American standard of living anywhere in the world is uh, on one side of a war with the rest of us. And a lot of us are really struggling with the implications of that. How do I live knowing that I'm on the wrong side? Not because I do that I use plastic straws. Not because of any specific actions I do, but just because of uh, where I am situated in the global chain of supply chain. You can't not be uh, in there because it's not you standing it up. It's the, uh, it's the s structures that you are enmeshed in that stand it up. Your individual participation is beside the point. And I think that is one reason people like to think of climate apocalypse in, in very uh, mid-century, mid-20th mid century terms. They want to think of it as another... Uh, Dr. Strangelove ending, because they love the idea of, uh, of you know, extinguishment. Rather, they certainly find more pleasurable to imagine about apocalyptic extinguishment than they do of just slowly over time becoming more inured to the misery dished out on our behalf and more uh, in need of a uh, escape, a mental justification for why uh, what I'm why I'm not trying to do something more, why I'm not risking anything to stop this. I'm not blaming anybody for that. I can see why, why you want to think, everyone wants to think that it'll just one day that you're always going to be, you can imagine yourself the victim of this thing. All right, folks, talk to you soon.